Um, I'm Damien. I'm just jumping in to take over from Kevin briefly, give him a bit of a breather and host Todd's session. Um, I'm the design leader of Small Axe. We're a non-profit workers cooperative and creative campaigning agency working on a range of progressive political campaigns. In particular, over the last kind of couple of elections, we've worked with the Stop School Class campaign and um, the Labour Community Organising Unit on the Green Industrial Revolution. So it's really exciting to be here today because as a movement, I think it's really, really important to constantly be learning um, from exciting kind of global progressive victories, especially on the left, and, and that's what today's all about. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Todd to talk about his work with New Zealand Labour. Um, Todd, to do the intro, is the creative director of Slash Backslash, a design studio specialising in art direction, typography and branding design. Originally from Dorset, um, England, but also a New Zealand resident. He's lived in Wellington for, for well over seven years, but is now back in the UK. Um, over the last six years, on and off, he's been working as the designer and senior comms advisor for the New Zealand Labour Party, particularly over the last three elections. In 2020, he was the designer for the party's COVID public health messaging and their general election digital campaign. And he's also worked on the Central 2016 Australian Labour campaign and with local groups in the UK Labour on by-election and single issue campaigns, as well as various other kind of charitable organisations, including Bernardo's New Zealand and the Sexual Abuse Prevention Network, as well as being a visual artist outside of his designing day job. Um, Todd's going to talk for about 35 minutes, I think. Um, after that, there'll be about 15, 20 minutes for questions, same as the last session. I have a couple kind of pre-prepared, but as much as possible, I'm keen to take some from the audience. I know that didn't go quite as clearly with people speaking, so hopefully we'll get the mics working on this time round. But without any further ado, um, take it away, Todd. We'll be excited to see some exciting campaign collateral. Uh, thanks so much, Damien. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, I've just been freaking out about being able to start my video. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for that, um, that introduction. Um, I'm just going to share my presentation now. Sorry, after 18 months of, um, of presenting remotely, I still always manage to screw this part up. So bear with me. Hopefully that worked. Uh, Someone will scream out if not. Um, and yeah, it's really great to be here with you all today. Um, I'm going to say kia ora, even though I'm from um, Dorset, like you said, um, I uh, lived in New Zealand for seven years. Um, I, I very much keep track of what's going on there. I'm actually quite tired right now because I've stayed up most of the night watching New Zealand's national vaxathon, um, where 2.5% of the population were vaccinated over a uh, course of eight hours. And um, yeah, it was a very interesting, to say the least, uh, televisual spec. Spectacular, um, but yeah, I'm also quite tired, so apologies for that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm actually presenting from Oxford, England, where I've been living for a few years. Um, and most of the creative that I'm going to be showing you today uh, was uh, was made remotely here. Um, in fact, yeah, all of it was uh, made remotely last year, um, working with the team over in Wellington, New Zealand, um, for both the COVID communications for the New Zealand Labour Party, but also uh, for their general election campaign. So, welcome. Um, it's also going to be quite a different presentation, I think, from Noel's. Noel really loved your presentation. Um, I feel like I'm going to be coming from the opposite um, end of things in terms of um, coming from making graphics as part of an institution. Um, what, what does it look like to make work um, that when you are working for a political party itself? Um, and also kind of revealing a little bit behind the thinking mentality and process of that. Um, I'm aware often that um, people only see the final cut, what goes out on social media, posters and billboards. Um, but I kind of want to also just give a little taste, a little sample of some of the work that goes in before that, some of the routes and options not taken, um, because actually I think that's also quite interesting. Um, and good to see the light of day occasionally. Um, but I'll start today with this tweet from a New Zealand journalist um, midway through last year's election campaign. Uh, the Labour Party is embracing edgy typography in place of edgy policies. Um, I'm not gonna speak to Labour Party policy, New Zealand Labour Party policy in this presentation. Um, my, my work, my job was to uh, get people to vote for Labour. Um, I'm, um, I've always been Labour, I'm very sold on 
labor values and the importance of getting labor in government. Um, I know obviously policies, platforms wildly change, but I tell you what can also change, typographical treatments. <laughs> and that's probably where, more where I'm going um, in this presentation. Um, but here's, an, here's a few more tweets, uh, just, just to start us off. Uh, this looks like shit. <laughs> uh, I don't like it one little bit. Uh, the typography is transformational, truly the nuclear free moment for political advertising. Um, yeah, you could say possibly our work went down um, and was uh, a very conflicted reception. Um, and yeah, graphic design is my passion. Uh, I didn't make this, someone made this, but it's definitely a commentary on the work that we made. Um, and uh, I love seeing all this come through because it meant that we were getting some cut through. Um, before we go to uh, what we actually produced in 2020 though, I'm gonna take you back in time to 2016. Um, in 2016, I, um, along with the team in New Zealand Labour rebranded the party or repointed their branding system. Um, we uh, readjusted their logo and we, uh, yeah, we made a branding scheme um, that was working for uh, the leader at the time, Andrew Little, who's preceded Jacinda Ardern as the leader of the party. And this is when they were in opposition. Um, we made a style guide and um, I'm not embarrassed to say that uh, I was very attached to uh, a very rigid style treatment. Um, as you can see on, on this page that I'm given, uh, giving you today, uh, yeah, I, I like line spacing. I like everything to be very exact. Um, everything to be ordered, neat, uh, digestible. Um, I'd say I'm probably still that kind of designer. Uh, but the 2020 election campaign uh, made me want to throw some of, uh, some of that out the window. Um, in 2016, I, I sat um, on the, the party's uh, kind of national um, publications committee where local groups would send um, the, the, the publications that they've designed locally in and we kind of say yay or nay, or the logo's in the wrong place, the logo needs to be smaller, logo needs to be bigger, etc. Uh, I was I was very much bought into the fact that anything Labour branded should be um, of a very distinct and certain style. Um, yeah, times can change, <laughs> um, as you'll see in a moment. But uh, some, this is a sample of some of the social media graphics that we were putting out a few years ago. Um, I'm giving these as well because I kind of I want to show you just how much we or I as a designer at the time was feeding from another very rigid, um, very complete style treatment um, for um, a political candidate around the world. Um, and sorry if this is triggering <laughs> for some of you, um, Hillary Clinton's um, campaign style, which um, which was uh, for me at the time like the pinnacle of um, really exacting style treatment, uh, color, type combinations, uh, use of photography. I was, I was obsessed and I'm not ashamed to admit it very much informed the way that I was um, making graphics for New Zealand Labour. Um, yeah, like I said, I think the, the, the rigidity and the, um, the very kind of clean look was exactly what I loved and, um, and this hit the nail on the head. But so we're gonna uh, zip forwards four years to 2020 last year, and um, we we're all set to go starting to work on some digital uh, campaign materials for Labour, uh, but then COVID hit. Um, COVID actually did eventually end up delaying the general election by a month, um, but uh, 2020 um, kind of slid from uh, COVID through to the general election campaign almost quite seamlessly. So the reason I'm sti starting talking about our COVID communications is because actually uh, I think it fed into uh, the development of the, the digital assets that we came up with for the general election. Um, so at the start of 2020, um, not for Labour, but just for my own amusement, I designed some um, kind of posters with public service message or announcement vibes, uh, but playing with typography and, and, and having some fun. Um, everything just seemed so bleak and dire back last March that I just kind of wanted to inject a bit of playfulness onto uh, some of the work that I was producing. 
um, and just kind of trying to cope with what was happening in the world, uh, but also kind of feel useful. Um, so these are some of the graphics that I was making just for my own amusement and putting out there. Um, what I didn't realize was that uh, my very good friends, um, 18,000 kilometers away in Wellington, saw them and thought, hmm, we actually need to um, liven up perhaps or, or, or get some cut through with our COVID health messaging. Um, and, and they got in touch. Um, so I came on board um, to think through what, uh, where we could take some of the COVID uh, digital comms in the design perspective. Um, they'd had some really thorough um, economic messaging coming through. Um, these graphics uh, show some of um, what we were putting out, what they were putting out at the time um, with very kind of um, information heavy, um, kind of serious and um, uh, very, I don't know, the messages that you would expect perhaps from um, a government reacting to uh, this kind of crisis. As you can see though, they're quite text heavy. Um, they, they use either stock photography. Um, yeah, they're very, um, someone I was showing these to someone the other day and they said they almost look like BBC news updates. They have that kind of uh, authority to them. Um, so we were wondering, can we kind of inject some sense of fun or levity, not, not to make fun of the situation, but to at least, um, uh, yeah, show up in people's feeds uh, a little bit more and, and, and stop people kind of scrolling right past them. I was actually just in preparation for this presentation, reading about um, how Netflix thinks about its thumbnails. And I think like net, Netflix thumbnails is very similar to um, social media graphics in, in that we, we browse them in a very similar way. Uh, we're looking for information that interests us. Um, and so apparently um, a Netflix viewer will browse uh, the app or site for 90 seconds and leave if they find nothing. So that's one and a half minutes um, of very intense interaction visually. They don't see anything, they'll, they'll leave. Um, apparently uh, a viewer will only look at a thumbnail for 1.8 seconds before moving on to the next one. Um, and a uh, human eye is, uh, moves at three to four times per second, apparently to process information and can analyze an image in as little as 13 milliseconds. Um, I think the reason I'm, I'm quoting these stats is because um, I, want, I want to draw attention to the fact that um, I don't think we often talk about the reality of people looking at imagery and how much we take in very quickly and also how much we dismiss very quickly as well. Um, I think this is relevant to, to text heavy um, or very kind of um, visually standard information um, like, like these graphics, because uh, I don't know, there's always a danger, I think, that we, uh, we put out communications if, if you're making them as part of a uh, political party or company or, or whatever, um, that don't immediately catch somebody in their tracks. And we're, we're fighting for attention um, for, uh, with, with so many other things, um, be them digital or print in the street. And I think actually that's some of the interesting things that brandalism do is kind of acknowledge that, that we're fighting for attention um, with things that happen in the world, posters, billboards, et cetera. There's just so much information nowadays. I think we have to get some real cut through. So I came on board to I don't know, yeah, to try to find a kind of a visual direction that would work and cut through. Um, so, oops, here we go. Uh, yeah, here are some style sheets. These aren't polished, these are just ideas. And um, I wanted to show them uh, because uh, they've, never, they've never been seen by anyone outside of the party before. Possibly shouldn't be sharing them, I don't know. No, <laughs> uh, it's, it's more just that um, here are some ideas that we're throwing out there and uh, maybe this will interest some people um, to see kind of the, the development of um, some communications. Um, we were looking at colors, we were looking at typefaces and uh, icons. Um, the message began in a very similar way to many other countries. I know in, in Britain we had the stay home, save at the NHS, save lives. Um, Be kind was a really strong message from Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister in New Zealand, um, which we were really honing in on. Um, here we were playing with composition and form, looking at um, color. Uh, red, obviously, being Labour's um, color in, in New Zealand, the same as Australia, UK. Um, 
features prominently or uh, at least somewhere in the, in the mix. Um, this is a very different treatment entirely. You might spot some similarities with my own work. We used some of the type um, with the, the posters that I made as my personal project here, um, making them a little less quirky, but still hoping for that kind of same impact, um, playing with composition. None of these went out into the world, um, but they all uh, are useful in informing um, the approach um, and, and looking at directions and pathways. Uh, we wanted to explore what it would look like with color. Um, I mentioned that labor red is really important, but um, yeah, we don't tend to use other colors. Um, when you're working for a political party, you're always aware that you're always quite hemmed in with what colors you can use. Um, political parties always attach a color or maybe two um, to themselves. So in, in New Zealand, uh, the, um, the, the central right party national has blue. Um, that feels kind of um, locked out of the equation because we don't want to be associated with them. Um, purple, I know, is uh, at various times has been used. Black is used. But, you do get, kind of get hemmed in. So we needed to keep red high in the mix, but could we explore green? Could we explore purple? Um, I don't know. These are also kind of some designs uh, that we came in. They were, I think we dismissed them pretty quickly, but um, they, uh, yeah, we were just looking at whether we could make it a little bit uh, punchy, a little bit bolder um, using um, curves and, um, and really kind of honing in on messages that would then reverberate on social media feeds. What, what will stop people scrolling in their tracks? Um, what will convey the message best? Um, some more looking at um, purple. I do love purple and red as a combination. So <laughs> I was pushing it pretty hard, um, uh, but yes. Sorry, I'm also, I have fewer slides than, um, the Noel's presentation. So I'll go a bit slower just so you can take them in. But, um, but yeah. The other thing that we had to be mindful of um, was that there was um, official messaging from the New Zealand government, very clear and very concise and internationally recognized uh, as, as being kind of um, best in field communication. Um, because it was so clear, it was so obvious at any one time, uh, who was speaking and it's because they adopted this um this really clear set of um visual style uh yellow white black yellow stripes uh the unite against covid19 message um the government worked with an ad agency clemenger bbdo in uh wellington new zealand um and they tasked them with uh very quickly turning around um a campaign um, that would uh, that would do the job that would communicate uh, COVID message. Um, so we we also thought, mm, can we latch onto this yellow uh, as it's become synonymous with the COVID nineteen health messaging? So we then tried to use yellow as well. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever tried to use this particular kind of yoky yellow with red. Um, it looks a bit like McDonald's. Um, so we very quickly moved away from that too. Um, so yeah, in the end, we, we just used red and white, um, very uh, stark, very simple messaging um, with, with type uh, that was kind of quite tall and bold. Um, yeah, and we feel it did the job in terms of labors, um, comms for, um, for what people should be doing and, and just kind of, yeah, carrying some key messaging. Uh, we also rolled that out to um, profile frames for Facebook, et cetera. Um, again, keeping with the kind of really stark white and red look. Um, here, introducing some of those curves because they work more along uh, with, with profile images, keeping that center area clear. Um, yeah, and we were really, we were quite happy with that. And the team in, in Wellington and in New Zealand kept on rolling them out with the typography, with the font we chosen, etc. Um, and it worked. But we then crashed headlong into the 2020 election campaign, uh, which um, 
the party had been working on for a long time and they brought an agency on board. Um, so once New Zealand had really managed to suppress and eradicate COVID from their borders, um, the let's keep moving line, which uh, was decided at some point prior to COVID, I believe, uh, was kept because it felt incredibly relevant. Um, and so this was front and center in the campaign alongside this um, gradient arrow uh, background device, uh, which as you'll see can also be used um, pale background um, with red text above. Um, this is another interesting fact about New Zealand political advertising is that they always tend to feature photos of candidates. It's almost like um, real estate um, agents um, in America or something. I remember when I arrived in New Zealand 10 years ago uh, in the middle of an election campaign and seeing all of these hoardings everywhere and thinking, wow, this is really odd that they have all their faces on there. I don't know if that's common place where, um, where everybody else lives, but um, in Britain, it didn't, coming from Britain, it didn't feel like something I was familiar with. But as you can see, this is the, uh, the branding for the campaign in action. Um, and yeah, there was um, a whole style guide produced for this, um, which ran to digital ads as well. And here's a selection of um, uh, example compositions for social media graphics. Uh, but having gone through the process of working with um, the team on the COVID communications and thinking about making things bold, punchy, we cut through, um, that would really kind of pop on people's feeds. I think we were just kind of querying whether we had enough assets or, I don't know, enough of a visual style to actually achieve that um, with the official um, campaign branding. Um, and I think we decided that we wanted to look into where we could take it a bit more. So we did, we started thinking, how can we um, move this style in a digital space um, to work a bit more, uh, to get some cut through. So these are some um, labor communications from the, the period moving forwards from the COVID health um, output to um, the election. Um, as you can see, it's, it's a lot punchier than we were looking at before. We've got uh, bigger type um, interacting with background elements where there's photography involved. Um, we've got nice kind of color, plain color backgrounds. Um, I don't know, it feels, it feels punchier. It feels like we started down the track of developing um, a visual style which worked. Um, the other thing I was really conscious of, and we didn't actively look at this at the time, um, but that every political party has a design history. Um, these are some posters um, from uh, the past hundred years of the New Zealand Labour Party. Um, and we didn't directly reference them, but I think it's always important to keep in mind when, uh, when making stuff for, for political parties that it's existing within an, uh, a long kind of storied history of design. Um, and actually, there's a lot of really rich styles, um, iconography, type treatments, um, that it feels like we kind of have turned our back on a little bit. Um, at least that's how I feel. Uh, and I'm kind of thinking about back to the 2016 work that I showed right at the beginning of this presentation, um, being really kind of rigid and um, rule driven, um, but actually making stuff that might accidentally be a bit too bland for um, kind of the radical purpose that we wanted to express. So I just kind of always have that in the back of my mind now. Um, I also, having gone through the process of looking at color and color options, purples, greens, whatever, and, and kind of hitting a brick wall with our confidence in using color, um, thinking about the rich possibility of uh, a monochromatic or a duotone approach. Um, so bringing together kind of, and really cementing this idea that if labor's color is red, um, can we use that to maximum effects and, uh, and make it itself a style device? Um, and in that, I'm kind of thinking, it kind of brings to mind uh, 
kind of one color screen printing, um, which I know has um, a, a long backstory with uh, political design anyway. Um, but it just feels like actually it's kind of a very, if you think you've only got one color to work with and you need to make a statement uh, that's bold um, and, and that works, you then start thinking in a very different way and white becomes itself um, a character in the mix um, and and how is it how can you use that one color to its maximum effect i really love this work as well i uh, um, on a side note i really think we should bring screen printing back into the mix um, with political um, advertising it's um i know everything i'm showing you uh, that we've worked on is digital but yeah, screen printing has a real nice texture, which um, I think we do lack nowadays. Um, the other slide I'm going to show you in this kind of inspo section uh, is sporting um, advertising. Let's uh, let's keep moving. The tagline feels like it's kinetic. It it, it it's talking about moving forwards, a positivity uh, that uh, something's going right, um, that we want to keep on that direction. Um, and yeah, it felt like uh, it felt like I could or we could borrow some of the um, the boldness behind um, sports advertising um, and kind of repurpose it for a political means. Um, and I mean, we're also advertising in a space where people might encounter you know an Adidas ad next to a Labour ad, a Nike ad comes after a, a labor ad on, a, on the feed, we are still competing with these big multinational corporations. Um, and so actually, if we're not using um, a visual approach, uh, which steps up to the mark and meets them, uh, are we gonna lose the ability to actually communicate our messages? So uh, with all of that in mind, uh, yeah, we kind of, we just started looking at um, what could this look like if we are going to burst away from the style. So then we started looking at let's keep moving as uh, as a slogan device um, and other kind of calls to to vote or support Labour. Uh, in New Zealand, they've got uh, an MMP mixed member proportional voting system. So you'll also see reference to two ticks Labour. Uh, you get one election, uh, one vote rather for your candidate or electorate. MP, Member of Parliament, um, but also a party vote, uh, which decides the overall proportion um, and makeup of Parliament. So that's what two ticks Labour means. It's a kind of shorthand for both Labour for your local electorate MP and Labour for the party vote. Uh, but as you can see, or I hope you can see anyway, that some of the kind of um, that kinetic um, energy uh, from kind of sports advertising or other kind of contemporary references coming through um, as we kind of tried and explored different ways and different different paths that we could take. And at this stage, at least like personally, I felt this red and white really stark approach um, was the one to go, th go with. So we designed a t-shirt just to start us off. Um, I actually think this is the one we chose. Oh, no, no, there was another one. <laughs> I forget. It's only a year ago. Um, uh, yeah, but I'm just going to show you just some of the, the concepts that we threw out there. Um, honestly, some we considered for a few seconds, others we deliberated on. But um, I just wanted to show you just kind of a taste of some of that process that we went through. Um, this, I think, is the eventual um, one we went with. And moving on to social. So basically, Print was in the bag. Uh, there were billboards up around the country um, with, with the standard style. Um, but then we really set about tearing up the style rules for digital and for social. Um, my, my computer hard drive was kind of littered with all of these different iterations of uh, either let's keep moving message or um, calls to vote labor, et cetera, in different formats, different fonts. Um, yeah. We, we made some uh, kind of into like a sticker format or um, little lockups, which could be superimposed on images, um, include on Instagram stories, etc. cetera. Um, these do move and <laughs> word of warning for anyone uh, preparing a presentation, don't update your 
operating system the night before. Um, I, I had this on Keynote and they were all moving and now it's just a PDF and they're all static. So imagine they, they move in what, some shape or form and apologies that I can't show you those today. Um, here's just some mock-ups, just thinking through how those would be applied to Instagram um, as well as some kind of uh, color background. Again, keeping that very stark red, white approach. Um, we obviously uh, had to convey uh, a range of information, um, be it kind of statements directly from the PM, um, quotes from speeches, um, or just kind of longer sentiments that we wanted um, voters uh, to latch onto. Um, and we rolled out a vast array of those. Um, but also many of what we were working on was just a really simple, um, let's keep moving, vote Labour message system, uh, which we really just wanted to hammer home. We were aware that um, the Prime Minister was incredibly popular, Labour was high in the polls, uh, it was Labour's to lose, um, and that this messaging system, well, this message itself, the let's keep moving message was working. So um, we just wanted to get it out there, but we didn't want people to bore or tire of the message. So. Um, I really see it as sort of as kind of my my chance to really kind of start exploring some of these uh, other ways of uh, composing imagery uh, and just kind of thinking how bold can we go with type um, to keep people's attention when we're posting these on feeds or pushing them out as paid advertising. So here's just another selection of very different um, ways of conveying basically the same message. Um, of course, Jacinda's front and centre as well. Um, that plays out incredibly well. Um, so we're pairing photography uh, with this red and white text. And some more. As you can see, we're really like, uh, sometimes it's a little bit more conventional. Other times we're kind of really pushing and pulling with this type, having a lot of fun with it. Um, pushing it as far as it can go. I <laughs> feel like Seeing this now, it's possibly bordering on uh, some legibility issues, but yeah, you can see, you can, hopefully you can see kind of um, where we're going with it. We also had other messaging or extending the um, let's keep moving um, messaging as we went through the campaign. Um, we, we didn't want people to get completely sick of the the sentence, but and this was really fun uh, to work on. Um, I feel like if I can uh, make a, a a pitch for breaking a style guide while you're working on an election campaign, is because it's a lot of fun and it feels quite risky. <laughs> um, the other thing I really liked about the two-tone approach is that it actually gives you um, a lot of freedom to either dial it up or dial it back down. So these kind of feel almost like quite economic, um, almost like a budget supermarket labeling, packaging labeling system or something. Um, but yeah, if you know, we don't want to saturate voters and we want to try every trick in the book. Um, so here's some simple messaging coming up to uh, election day or election period. Um, and some of our get out the vote work, um, remind your friends in Fano, which means family in Te Reo Māori in New Zealand, to vote Labour. Again, just like pushing it out, making it, making it fun and noticeable. Uh, these are some of my favourite work that we did uh, because we go high impact. Um, the message, I always love putting two ticks label, vote label on a piece of material anyway, it feels like somehow um, that's exactly, I'm doing exactly what I should be doing in life. Um, but if you can kind of make it as high impact as possible, then all the better. Um, and then that carried through to uh, simple messaging post-election, building on the momentum of an election win, which um, yeah, was pretty sizable. Of course, I'm not sure I was planning to mention this at this point in the presentation, but when you are working on a campaign which is either going to 
you get a sense it's going to be successful or not. You always wonder how much uh, design actually plays a part. Um, I don't know. I'd like to think that we, uh, I'd like to think that we did sway some voters um, with, with these messages that cut through, but it's almost impossible to tell. Um, I think basically at the end of the day, what you're doing is amplifying a message as much as possible, making sure that um, the right message is hitting home. Uh, but it also, this work that we that we did with digital did start to bleed over into the print campaign. Um, here's a social graphic that was put out as part of the early voting period in New Zealand with a very similar one that we, that we actually ran a billboard campaign um, around uh, some of the major cities in New Zealand. Um, and yeah, we I think we managed to push the boundaries of um, what the party and um, uh, maybe some of the MPs were wanting um, through the success of some of the social media that we put out, which is a very satisfying thing. <laughs> um, also, I think we had quite a lot, a lot of impact in the area. These two graphics um, as an area, I mean, geographically speaking, Australia being next door to um, New Zealand, um, we're seeing a lot of the creatives that we uh, championed last year come through, um, sometimes in a quite an obvious way um, in Australia, um, which I actually personally love because I think, um, you know, we're all in solidarity around the globe and we're all learning from each other, as you saw earlier from the Hillary Clinton work informing me in 2016 in New Zealand. Um, I love that um, another uh, Labour Party uh, or people working for Labour have picked up the baton that we um, left at the last election and are running it with it as well. Um, yeah, this just made me feel really happy to see. Um, and also, funnily enough, um, oh no, sorry guys, <laughs> uh, just days after the New Zealand election was the culmination of the US election um, and uh, and with that some kind of retrospective of uh, the Biden campaign graphics, which I actually haven't been paying much attention to because I've been so busy with in New Zealand. Um, but actually some of the uh, yeah, some of the commentary coming out afterwards and looking back at some of the graphics that the Biden campaign were trying, some of which are included here, gradients really crazy counterintuitive font choices, just some really, uh, really bizarre quirky stuff, which um, you either love or hate, um, uh, will certainly stop you in your tracks on social. Um, I'm, I'm not saying it's anything similar to what we were doing in New Zealand, but I do feel like um, the, the approach was similar in terms of making something that stands out, making something that stops people in their tracks, that conveys the message simply because it's impossible to ignore. Uh, and I, I think for me, the takeaway uh, from last year, uh, both New Zealand uh, Labour, but also looking at the Biden-Harris stuff, is that message, be bold. I feel like somewhere in the, along the way, we've lost uh, our ability to be bold in Labour. Uh, I certainly, uh, and I mean this with, uh, with no disrespect to anyone present or, or not, but I know that UK Labour put out uh, quite a lot of very plain looking materials. I know that I've been guilty of doing the same in New Zealand for New Zealand Labour. Um, I know that obviously we have to hit a wide variety of targets and marks, um, especially during election campaign, but also in the fallow years between. Um, but I, yeah, I just, I, I think it's a good opportunity to just consider um, boldness as, um, as a style guide um, imperative itself, in itself. Uh, yeah, uh, let's all kind of pledge to just kind of push it out a little bit more and, and make it more visible because um, like Noel said in, in session one, um, the right uh, are moving, they know what to do, they know what will grab attention um, and they're not afraid to, to be bold, they're not afraid to do what they need to do to get their messages across. Um, we need to be the same.
Um, so yeah, let's let's deliver stuff with punch, um, with nerve, uh, with with brains. I'm not claiming that last point for me necessarily, but I think that's important. Um, and yeah, with that, that's um, that's everything I wanted to share with you today. Wow. Thanks so much, Todd. That was genuinely fascinating. It was really refreshing to hear a designer talk with such saliency about kind of design on the left and particularly the labour. I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely overflowing with questions, but I think what we'll do is we'll just go straight to the ones we've got in the Q&A so far, and then hopefully there won't be any more and I can ask some. But um, I think if we can start with Aaron, if you'd be up for... Um, asking your question. If not, I can relay. Yeah, I would be happy to ask it. Uh, I do a lot of work for my local Labour Party. Uh, in Scotland, we're one of the only councils in North Ayrshire who are Labour. Uh, so it's just seeing how I had any tips or advice about how taking those sort of achievements we have from our Labour administration and putting it into like a story that people could relate to. I'm sorry, Aaron, I didn't catch the full the full question. Do you mind repeat, repeating? It just broke up for me. Yeah, sorry, it's the internet here. <laughs> uh, it's just, how do we take our achievements and make it sort of relatable for people to relate to? Because a lot of our achievements are very sort of stats, the number of houses we're building. How, do you have any advice on how to, like, for example, on Instagram, how do we make that more sort of relatable? Oh, I think that's tricky. I mean, it's a messaging thing as well as a graphic um a graphic problem. Um, I, I do think we need to learn how to be more emotive, to tell stories, um, not just share stats. I think uh, we're always tempted to share stats because for us engaged in the labour movement, we're, we're always kind of seeing, um, seeing things that have convinced us personally um, of the benefits of labour and government or in council, etc. Um, but it's how we reach other people. And I feel like I, it was almost sacrilegious to say, but um, you know, big multinational companies know how to hit people where it matters um, in terms of, I don't know, coming up with really convincing or emotive material. Um, I don't think um, Adidas, Amazon, whatever, become as big as they are if they're not able to market themselves effectively. And I think that for me as a designer, the biggest influence I have is just simply walking around town and seeing where the money is and how they are and how companies who are kind of advertising on the side of buses or bus shelters, what language they're using, uh, what imagery they're using, how they're composing their, their materials. Um, I don't know, that's not actually practical advice, I'm sorry to say, but I think it's, I, I do think we need to kind of lift our gaze and look at what's going on in the wider world uh, and feed from that. I hope that answers your um, your question somewhat. Amazing. Can we move on to Claire? We had a question about negative campaigning. Quite interesting. Hi, Claire. If not, I'm going to jump on it in the interest of time. Okay, cool. Um, what type of stuff was the opposition creating in NZ during the 22? 2020 election, and did you do any negative campaigning? I suppose it's referencing attack ads or anything. Um, did we do any negative campaigning? I tell you what, I worked, I didn't work on any negative stuff. Um, and I think uh, this kind of goes to the central brand of Jacinda Ardern, um, Prime Minister, which is uh, kind of relentlessly positive. I feel as well, uh, I mean, the opposition in New Zealand are kind of tied up in knots uh, because. Labour are doing just so well, their, their COVID response has been uh, second to none. There's a very little kind of angle to attack. Um, but no, I mean, we were really focused on just amplifying the positivity, the fact that Labour um, had, um, had moved the country out of this danger zone um, and just kind of amplifying that positive feeling. I know I have, um, I have worked on campaigns before with, with, with negative stuff. It tends to Funnily enough, be only when you're in opposition. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm just going to jump on that while I've got an opening. Um, I'm really interested just generally with political branding, especially with candidates like how the candidate brand 
then ultimately trickles out into the rest of the visual content that comes out around the campaign. Could you just expand a little bit on, on just in this personal brand and, and how that kind of influenced broadly the visual identity and the rest of the stuff that's coming out? I mean, I think, um, yeah, I mean, you have to take every candidate, um, every party um, on its own merits. Um, so the thing about Jacinda is that um, she, was, she was always uh, already really beloved by the point, uh, by the time she became the prime minister. Um, I actually think it was COVID that shifted things even further in her direction because of her competency and the fact that she was fronting to the country every day at a, at a presser. Um, uh, so those kind of values of kind of um, positivity, uh, of kind of quite youthful energy, um, I like to think that we were kind of tapping into with, um, with some of this work. I don't think we would have made graphics uh, type treatments like the ones that we, we did for last year for other candidates. I don't, that's the interesting thing is that I've, I've, I've given a showcase of stuff that we did for last year that with Jacinda as leader, uh, because it works for her, but and I'm not kind of saying copy this exactly and you'll win an election. <laughs> By no means that's the case, but it's more like tap into the values of the candidate and the party or, or kind of the, the public's perception at the time and really kind of run with it. So I think definitely when you relate to like AOC, her, her personal identity is so, so intertwined with that visual identity and you couldn't separate the two. And we've seen obviously a lot of kind of copycat over, yeah. over the last couple of years. But you still can't separate the fact that she is the brand and, and the two are socially intertwined. But anyway, uh, there's more there, but we've got to go to another question from the audience. Can we have Gabriel please asking your question? Hi, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Hi, Gabriel. Yeah. Hey, Todd. I really appreciate your use of typography to make the photography more dynamic. It was almost like you're culture jamming yourself <laughs> and your standard <laughs> voice, which got me thinking about. Bernie Sanders and his um, campaign was informed by memes. Mm. And the reason why I'm saying that is because it seems like his campaign piggybacked on memes, which gave the tone of the campaign feel more democratic and inclusive, which I believe a lot of times um, as marketers and designers, we have this high level vision of things. And sometimes they exclude those communities that 1% of voting needs, for example, uh, queer communities, communities of color, uh, color, uh, colors. And uh, thank you again, that's it for me. Thanks, I, um, yeah, I, I agree with your sentiment, um, Gabriel, about uh, needing to reach different areas of society. Um, I, th I think I was always aware, actually, as a, as a designer, I'm always looking for like a very polished, um, uh, very turned out appearance in the graphics I make. I'm actually awful at making memes. Like it's excruciatingly bad <laughs> when I try and make a meme. I have friends that are like, that's, they, they, they do it so well. Uh, they run meme accounts. It's like, I'm totally in awe and I just can't do it because it requires, I think you set, uh, you have to set to the back of your mind quality uh, of uh, aesthetic. Uh, also, I just don't have the type of sense of humor to cut through. So. I'm, I, I, it depends on what type of designer you are as well. I think, um, uh, Noel, you said uh, in your previous um, session, you know, why aren't unions bringing people on board to make memes to kind of combat misinformation or to kind of uh, sell the vision um, of the left? Um, I totally think that needs to be the case. I would want a political party to have a meme maker. Um, I think uh, we need design uh, and all types of different design. You know, um, I'm making official labor graphics but we need local um groups to be making local labor graphics we need meme makers we need all sorts of designers who are um both on the party uh, payroll and not to be kind of all feeding in together to kind of be working together for that central aim on that can i just jump in quickly like how what are your opinions on decentralizing and democratizing the kind of design labor around the election campaign and and how strong are your feelings, especially coming from what you were saying earlier about like the rigidity of the brand and, and your, I suppose, like your preciousness and design ego coming into it as well. Like, how do you feel about opening it up with, with like the rise of Canva and democratized design software? It's a, it's a journey that I'm still on. 
yeah. uh, as a designer, I think uh, we all have our own uh, aesthetic taste and opinion. Um, and uh, back when I was Mr. Style Guide in 2016 <laughs> or before, uh, I was always quite nervous about that decentralization. And I, I would often have sometimes quite terse phone calls with local groups. And um, I think that reflects badly on me and I've done some learning myself. Uh, I'm, I'm a perfectionist or I tend to be, I think, in my design sensibilities. But actually at the end of the day, what we need is everybody working together pushing messages out there. Uh, it doesn't, I don't think it matters that the, the logos skew uh, or, you know, you're using the right typeface. Uh, it just matters, I think, that uh, people are active and getting messages across. I mean, sometimes those messages maybe contradict one another, they might contradict the central party message, et cetera. And uh, I don't think I have a concrete answer for that, but, you, I don't know. I just think, uh, yeah, we're all part of the same family. We need to be working together. Brilliant. All right, I'll take another one from the audience now. Um, I'm just going to read Michael's question out just because it's quite long. Um, hi, Todd. What did you find most difficult during the design phase while working from across the globe without direct interaction with someone face to face? Did that directly impact your approach and create more of a rigid corporate approach to create a compromise in areas? I don't know if I would have done it so well or even been so keen to do it if I hadn't already worked in the office in Wellington and known many of the people I'm working with, some of whom are really good friends, uh, who I've become really good friends with over the years who are working on labor projects together. I think that makes it, uh, it made it easier because um, we, we already knew our working processes. Uh, it also meant that we could kind of shorthand or like cut, you know, cut the, to the quick and um, I don't know. And there's, they're not afraid, afraid of being honest with me. And, you know, I know that I can send them stuff that I'm a bit confused about that they'll kind of look at and either say yay or nay. Um, also, I was only kind of actually at the end of the day working with a few people directly um, who would then feed that out to the wider group there. So that made it quite useful. And actually, if you're ever working remotely, if anyone's ever working re remotely like that, I'd certainly recommend pinning down one or two people that you're in direct contact with. Cool. I mean, I have quite a functional question, I think, that hopefully applies to, to kind of the spirit of the day. Um, it's something that we're always grappling with as an organisation is that there's just not enough good design jobs in the sector, in the UK specifically, I'm talking about in America is an entirely different landscape, and I don't know what it's like in New Zealand. But I suppose there's only that many jobs to go into when you graduate if you're studying design. Um, what advice would you have for anyone who's trying to break into the space? Um, I, I would say just persist. Um, I, I, I got working for labor through, I didn't study graphic design. Um, I'm, I'm a fine artist by trade, I, I paint. And I, I got into design through uh, a local labor group in Wellington on the ground. Um, and I was also kind of involved with some climate activism there as well. Uh, and I would volunteer my time. Uh, I know that everyone isn't necessarily in a position where they can volunteer time, um, but that was my pathway in. And I would say, if it's something you're really passionate about, try to find people who are also passionate about that and work or work with lo local groups and see what you can make happen. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's never enough money for designers. Um, that's also the case in New Zealand. I, I wish we could have a bigger team um, of paid designers, but it's never the How case. The team? Just out of interest? Say again? How big's the team? But in, out of interest. Uh, it swells come election time, um, but it's actually, it's skeletal. I'd say probably about three designers uh, oh, wow. during the term. It's probably a bit, a bit bigger now that Labour are in government. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it was skeletal. Okay, cool. We've got one more question from Anne. Anne, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Take your away. Hi, Anne. Hi. Um, I'm communications officer for Labour International, which is oh, the, the CLP for Labour Party members who live outside the UK. I'm actually in Slovakia at the moment. But I went to the UK for a conference this year, just a, just a short while ago. And it seems that our... I mean, I really love that stuff you were doing, especially the emphasis on the red and white, the, the bold 
uh, stark colours, mm -hmm. the party colours. And I think we're all fond of our party colours, or most of us are, but it seems that our, our party leadership at the moment isn't so fond of our party colours. They seem to be doing having the opposite approach, not, not being too bold. And for example, this was the 2019 um, uh, conference, conference uh, program. Uh, here's the here's the 2021. It's kind of a. a I don't think we can. Um, if you, are you, you showing us something, Anne? Because I don't think we can see. Can you not see me? Ah, oh, okay. Sorry. I see myself either. Never mind. Anyway, I'll tell you the the the, the conference brochure for this year. The, the program, the book we get if we're a delegate or a visitor. It's a sort of greenish, greyish, bluish colour. It's hard to work out. On the back, it's red, which is an ad for, ad for the Daily Mirror. Um, the conference banner outside the hall and showing up on the screen inside was kind of pink fading into blue. And I'm wondering, you know, uh, what do you think would be behind that approach and how do you think that might work? I think it's interesting because we're talking about party conference here, which... Um... Uh, I know that, that that banner behind with the gradient uh, was seen on broadcast um, media, news, et cetera. And I wonder whether it's a way of signifying a break from before. I know in, in 1997 um, with New Labour, one of the things um, that, that Peter Mandelson suggested they do was move to a purple in the later stages of an election campaign. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think sometimes people feel a bit like red is an angry, loud colour. I don't know. I mean, I think we should embrace it. I, I, I share your sentiments, Anne, but I, I wonder whether they're just trying to try something new. I don't know. I mean, UK Labour have many things that they uh, need to resolve, I think, but colour may be not one of them. Cool. Unfortunately, I think that's it. We have to cut it short. But thanks again so much, Todd. That was fascinating. Um, and I think I'm handing back over to Kevin or the team for the next session. But thanks again. That was brilliant. And thanks to all the questions as well. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Damien.